Hello, my name's Mark Pennington and I'm the Chairman of the Technical Committee of the Federation of Piling Specialists. Today I'd like to run through the latest update to the electronic pile schedule. This presentation is going to be in, uh, in, in three main parts. I'll start off by running through the reasons for the schedule. I'll then cover um, the reasons for the update to the schedule before going into the details um, of, of the new schedule and exactly what's changed. So the FPS are very keen to move forward with managing all data digitally. Members of the FPS have used their own various types of guidance, including stuff that they've produced themselves, to develop their own digital data management systems. This includes use of common data storage areas, and various different ways to capture design and construction data. This includes mobile devices in the field to capture data digitally and even using rig instrumentation to capture construction information immediately without manual input. Modeling is also developed using BIM models to capture as-built information, produce logistics plans and look at 4D planning. However, our experience is this is not fully embedded with the industry. And I think this is for three main reasons. Firstly, there's not a consistent approach with the industry. The input and the output information vary significantly. Secondly, there's no contractual requirement for foundation subcontractors to provide information in a consistent and digital format. And thirdly, the data and the models are not always linked. This means that to update the models is sometimes very clunky when the data is changed. I think if we can solve these three key issues, then I would believe we'll be able to open a lot of opportunity. The first opportunity has to be around the data management. If we look here at this very simplistic model, which is set out around processing data digitally as part of a foundation subcontract. By definition, as this is a subcontract, the project will hold a certain amount of data and may even have its own project model constructed from that data. The key to being able to process this data is to have standard input and output data. Currently, one area that's being reviewed within the UK is the use of AGS format as the standard data language for the, for the whole of the foundation industry. And currently, all site investigation information is produced using this format. And it would seem a sensible step forward to expand this further. So that would be part of the standard input and standard output information. In addition to that, all foundation elements should be coded. And the obvious way around coding these in the same way is using the Uniclass format, which is already in process. And the third way is the electronic path schedule, which is what we're talking about today. So we're proposing if we have these three standard methods of uh, input and then standard methods of output data, um, it will be it will make the process a lot better. With the standard input and output information, then the development of ways to process the data can follow. This could include transmitting information to and getting information directly from the rig instrumentation in a consistent way, using data to develop designs and capturing construction information digitally in the field. But also could add to the processing of the site investigation information to make it more consistent. If we get the data transfer right, then the model development can follow. This can develop as the data develops. The final piece of the jigsaw is the contractual arrangement. This needs to be part of the contract to supply consistent and clear digital information to actually embed it properly within, uh, within, the, within the foundation industry. But to have a standard contract, you need the standard information. So really we can see the EPAL schedule, which we're talking about today, is a key part of forming uh, this standard input and output information. So that was a little bit about why the schedule is needed and how it would fit into a new digital kind of process. So if we look now at the EPAL schedule itself and why we needed to update it. So the previous version of the schedule was created in 2012. It was about eight years ago now. Terminology has been um, updated to make it more consistent with the Euro code. Combination tables have been added. We found that co yeah, having combination tables within the schedule will um, save a lot of confusion. 
and there were also guidance notes with examples provided because that was feedback from what we had from the previous version um, that the, the guidance notes weren't clear enough to make the schedule usable. The need for a, a standard schedule not only is helping the digital process um, that we've spoken about, it's around being um, aligned with the Euro codes to make sure we are compliant with the Euro code in a, in a very consistent way, and also to make sure there is full consistency, completeness, and clarity um, on PAR loading. We'll go on to, in, in, in a minute, some examples of PAR schedules, which add, to com add confusion to the subcontract PAR designers. These are some examples of some PAL designer questions. So we uh, we asked the Federation of Parling Specialist Designers for some feedback on how they were working with PAL designs they were having to carry out and some of the issues they were experiencing. And here we can see some of the comments that we found and why we needed to revise the schedule. So we had some information that was provided, um, you know, which meant that the groundwater, for example, wasn't clear how the groundwater would be applied to the pile loading, whether the actions were favourable or unfavourable, um, which the leading variable action was. These were unclear, and so it le led to an, un uh, an unclear pile design. The problem with having unclear information when you're carrying out pile tenders is that in many instances, the pile tender designs are carried out in a very short period. This means it's, always, it's not always possible to get back to the structural engineer to clarify the loading combinations uh, in order to carry out the designs. This means that tenders are produced and contracts are let based on unclear information, which leads to problems further on down the line. This results in say, additional risk to the project and additional cost, either borne by the contractor or the client, depending on how the contract is set out. So having a consistent approach would ease, uh, would, would allow that to be uh, uh, stopped. I wanted to run through now some recent examples of PAL schedules that we've had, that we've seen within the, in the Federation of Parliament Specialists and how different they are. So here's the first example. And again, you won't be able to read that properly, but basically that's a PAL schedule for around about eight PALs. And there aren't two schedules, one over the top of each, another. Uh, the PAL schedule, PAL number one, carries along the first table and into the second table. So really, you can see by definition how those different loads are applied to the pile and what loads are actually designing the pile to can really be up to a significant interpretation by the pile designer, and it can lead to significant variances. The terminology is not in Eurocode format, um, but as I say the main problem is just the sheer number of different combinations and how they're applied together. The second example we have here as I say, is around actually a load on a pile cap. So here we can see that the, the loading information, again, is not Euro code compliant. And because it's actually a load on a pile cap, um, when you take that load from the cap and transfer it down into the piles, um, it can lead to even further errors in the pile loading information that's used for the pile design. And finally, here's another example, um, which again, provides loads in a non Euro code format. There are also non-numeric numbers within the schedule. You can see on the pile diameter there, and there's a diameter sign. This means that even if the schedule is provided in the electronic format, it's not always possible to manipulate it to be able to get um, in, in you know, to be able to manipulate it electronically because you've got to take out the non-numeric features. I think those yeah you know, those three examples really do just highlight some um, you know, some variances within the schedule and the need for a, a consistent approach. And again, just, just again to, to sort of clarify the benefits, you know, consistency, transparency, minimizing confusion and risk that might be built up and to achieve um, an increased take up with digital construction. As well as it being highlighted as a need to the Federation of Piling Specialists, the need for an electronic pile schedule has also been flagged up within the latest edition of the specification for piling and embedded retaining walls. Here we can see that attention is drawn to the FPS electronic pile schedule. So it's not a requirement to provide um, loads in this in this manner, but it is viewed and recognized by the uh, yeah, by the specification, by the ICE document, um, that it would add a an advantage um, to most projects providing information in this format. So that's quite a lot around um, the need for the schedule and the reasons for the update and the benefits of the schedule. I now want to go in uh, to a little bit more detail around the schedule itself. 
The, sched the schedule itself is an Excel format, so it's a, a, a well-known format we use. Um, the schedule comes in three tabs in the spreadsheet. There is an index tab, there's the path schedule itself, and then there is a combinations of actions table. This here, we can see on the screen, is the index tab and defines the terminology and symbols that are adopted from the Euro codes. The second tab, and it's the main tab around the schedule itself, comprises five sections. These sections are the PAL reference, the PAL geometry, the EC7 vertical actions, the EC7 horizontal actions, and then the output of PAL design. The example schedule that we've got uh, gives guidance on the input required for the first four of these sections. This is as if they are completed by a structural engineer specifying um, the, the, the PAL loading. The fifth section, the PAL design, is generated by the PAL designer. This will be things like the tow levels and the reinforcements, etc. You know, where the PAL diameters are specified, so they should be stated in the PAL geometry section. However, when not specified, the PAL designer can determine and the PAL designer and the PAL diameter column will be will be left blank and the PAL designer will fill that in. The, uh, the next section, the third section, is the vertical actions. And the vertical and horizontal action columns of the schedule are the real meat of where the, um, you know, where, where the loads are produced. So the structural engineer should provide all of the individual characteristic actions of the PAR loading, as we can see here on the, on the first few columns, as well as the maximum and minimum set B, set C, and other ultimate limit state design actions. Um, and these are all calculated from the different load combinations that you would need in, in the load combinations table we'll come on to. So this is really the standard way of, of, of showing all of the vertical actions. When any moments are given, then their orientation must be stated in the notes section or detailed on, on, on drawings provided. Groundwater actions uh, are a key element. You know, we noted that in the, in the comments we received back from the Federation of Parliament Specialist um, members around the issues with the previous version of the um, of, of the schedule and also on how schedules are received at the moment, that water uplift always caused concern and always caused issue and confusion around how it should be applied. So within this schedule, it's tried to specify that very clearly. Groundwater uplift actions in the schedule have been scheduled as permanent design actions rather than characteristic actions. This follows the current geotechnical practice to determine ultimate limit state and, S and serviceability limit state groundwater levels without then applying partial factors. So again, it's made clarification on how the groundwater is applied, and I say this is a key section of the um, of the schedule. Horizontal actions in the pile design um, are specified in a similar way to the vertical actions. And then we can see the fifth part of this section, the fifth column, which is the pile design itself, which then, based on the information provided in the first four, can be filled in um, easily and with clarity um, by the by the PAL designer. And the third tab in the spreadsheet that covers all the stuff in the second in the second tab of the spreadsheet around the around the loads. The third tab in the spreadsheet, which is the you know, the combination of actions sheet, this details you know, how the actions should be applied together. Together it gives examples um, of of how the load should be applied. So combinations can become numerous and complex. It's important that the structural engineer provides a meaningful description for each combination. SLS combination equations are also required to be provided. So these SLS serviceability limit state equations allow both working PAR test loads to be determined, as well as calculating the serviceability performance of the PAR, including total settlement and differential settlement between the PARs. So again, the combinations as, as, as defined need to show the ULS and the SLS uh, parameters. So, in summary, the FBSC electronic pile schedule um, <clears throat> is really providing the characteristic actions, the load uh, the case combinations, and the ultimate design actions for pile design. This allows full transparency in the transfer of the design information. So it should take away confusion um, from how loads are uh, you know, uh, designed from pile subcontractors um, and add clear transparency back to the structural engineers that the loads that should be provided, uh, you know, she should be allowed onto the pile, are actually allowed on, are actually uh, taken onto the pile itself. The electronic schedule is, is free to download, 
um, in Microsoft Excel format from the FPS website. We can see the details there, fps.org, uh, uh, through to the technical section. And really, we're just asking people to look at that schedule and provide piling loading information in this format to add consistency and to ease the flow of digital data uh, through, the, through the piling subcontract. And finally, I'd just like to finish in, on, on a bit of a, another cell around the AGS data. Um, so as well as wanting the piling information in the electronic pile format, we know that the AGS data does um, exist for most projects or any site investigation that's produced nowadays is produced and uh, carried out in AGS format or summarized in AGS format. Within the piling subcontractor world, we don't often see the AGS format. It gets lost basically in translation down from the site investigation through the project uh, uh, project lifecycle before it gets down into the piling subcontractor. If the AGS data is handed through to the piling subcontractor, again, it makes the process, digital process, a lot more easy to follow. So AGS data that can be provided and the completed electronic pile schedule will be issued. This will allow um, you know, a, a lot more straightforward tender designs and contract designs to be produced. Thank you very much.